Welcome back to the second day of the OPC Day International 2021 here to the North America and late European session. Welcome back here. Today we have more technical uh, topics on our agenda. And before we start with Jim Luce, the CTO of the OPC Foundation, to give us a report on the status of OPCA and the roadmap, please allow me to make a short advertisement for the Achema Pulse, which is happening next week. And I like to summarize a little bit why we are really a proud sponsor, one of the main sponsors of the Achema Pulse. We believe that the OPC Foundation has fantastic offerings for the process automation world. By the way, remember OPC at the beginning was exactly OLA for process control. So this is a domain where we started long time ago. Today, obviously, it's openness, productivity and communications because with OPCUA we are platform independent. But to summarize the offerings for the process industry, I believe OPCUA will play a major role in the next decades because number one, OPCUA is not a protocol, it's instead transferring standardized information, protocol independent in an end-to-end -end secure way. Very robust. Second, the world's largest ecosystem for secured industrial interoperability, completely neutral, independent, not dominated by a specific company or a specific country or region. Plus the OPCA FX Gravity Center, the, the group who is taking care on all kinds of field communications, including safety, deterministic and motion. Third, we joined the Ethernet APL initiative because Ethernet APL is a fantastic enabler for us, not only for us from the edge down into field where multiple also established field bus systems will run over. But OPCUA is the only technology scaling then from field up to cloud and back. Plus all the information models, which we listed already yesterday, which are, well, the OPC Foundation has 63 of them in total right now. But listing PADIM, DEXP, I shouldn't have started listing them because I'm mining uh, weighing technology, pumps, and, and, and so on. So you get a detailed overview joining the um, Achema Pulse. And if you need a ticket, please contact us. So with this, i like to give you a short teaser. Look here. Hello and a warm welcome here. The OPC Foundation like to invite you to join the Achema Pulse 2021. Please join our presentations and a real world demonstration, including devices from multiple companies like Samsung, Anderson Hauser, Peppel and Fuchs, but also solutions from Microsoft. We are collecting data on the field level and move them up through Azure Cloud, including different technologies like Ethernet APL, OPC Unified Architecture, but also using standardized information models like PADIM. Please join our sessions. Okay, so that was a short teaser at the beginning, but now we start with the technical sessions in general. Today, it's the technology day. We have Jim Luce as a speaker from North America. We have Randy Armstrong giving you details on the IIoT starter kit. We have Erich Bahnstedt explaining you how to move data easily from the edge up to the cloud and back. We have our friends from the West Coast US from Sesme uh, talking about the UA cloud library. And at the end, today we have one European speaker. Today uh, it's Alexander Almendinger talking about um, certified products uh, that we extended the CTT tool and he is also giving us a short overview, a short teaser on the new marketplace. With this I'm handing over to Jim Luce. Good morning Jim. Uh, please introduce yourself and explain us what's new. Hello everyone. Welcome to OPC Day International 2021. My name is Jim Luke. Um, I'm a software architect for Schneider Electric but I also serve as the CTO of the OPC Foundation, and I chair the OPC UA Working Group. It's my pleasure to be here today and to present our Working Group status for the OPC UA Working Group. 
So what I'd like to cover today is a, a brief description of, of our working group organization and um, the release status of our 105 release. Uh, the OPCUA working group uh, maintains the core specifications for the OPC unified architecture. And I want to talk about our 105 release and what's new in them. And I'll also talk a little bit about how the releases will be a little different going forward, uh, starting with the 105 release. So the organization itself, uh, the OPC UA Working Group has been around for many, many years now. Um, and we are now, we're currently organized uh, with a main working group that, that approves and produces all of the output that you see in the forms of specification. But we have several subgroups that work on specific topics, uh, given the specialty nature of, of those uh, technicalities. So we have the security working group, we have a pub sub prototyping working group, uh, a time sensitive networking working group, and one concerned with semantic validation. So on this on the slide here, you see the, the uh, email addresses of the chairman of, of the groups. And if you would wish to join any of those groups, you simply send them an email. So OPC UA, uh, Version 1.05, I'm pleased to announce uh, the first batch of, of the 105 release uh, has been posted for a member review uh, beginning last month. And this is a long time coming. Uh, we have many, many, many pages to this multi-part specification now, and uh, we're, we're on a path to get uh, the new release out uh, relatively quickly. So right now, the, the 12 parts that are out are in, in for review for a 90 day period. And then hopefully the other parts will follow uh, on a planned quarterly cadence. And eventually we'll get uh, into a well-oiled machine where we release uh, things on a very, on a very uh, scheduled basis, but based on the calendar. So here you can see all 22 parts that are expected to be part of version 105 of OPC UA. Uh, the highlighted ones are the, are the 12 that are currently out for release candidate review. Um, and again, you can see that the, we've, we've made a good dent in the, in the entire number of specs and hopefully the others will follow uh, in the following months. So when we talk about the 105 release, it's largely a maintenance release. Um, and by that, I mean, we've taken all of the fixes and uh, changes that were published in, in form of errata in 104. And of course, we've applied them directly to the 105 documents to make them up to date. We've similarly taken all of the amendments that we produced as part of the 104 release, and we folded those into the, uh, into the 105 parts. So we have a clean specification with all of the, all of the bits and pieces in it that, were, that have been previously published. In addition to what's previously been published, uh, we do uh, often, or I should say, we clarify things. There could be text that has changed slightly to aid in understanding. Additional examples have been added in some cases. And this is done just for clarity. These are not technical changes to the document. And oftentimes, they're not, all of them are not tracked. Um, however, there are some more significant changes to 105 that I want to call your attention to. So first of all, some of the part five information models that we uh, that we had in often in appendixes in part five have been broken out and they now have their own parts. So specifically state machine, file transfer, role-based security, and dictionary reference now are, are located in their own parts um, and instead of being annexes to part five. Uh, the content is the, is the same. Uh, these were all published either in Part 5 or, or in amendments to Part 5 in 104, and uh, now they have their own parts. Another new feature is uh, the safety specification, Part 15, that was previously published, now has support for PubSub. And this is sort of a major uh, addition to the, the safety uh, support in, in, in allowing the PubSub. And this, of course, supports our field-level communication activity around around safety. And lastly, uh, 
we've added conformance units uh, to, to all of the defined nodes. And I'll talk about that uh, a little more uh, in, in a little more depth to, to explain what, what I mean by that. So in servers, uh, prior to version 105, um, OPC UA servers were expected and required to expose all of the nodes defined in, in the UA namespace, what's known as namespace zero, um, in their address space. So the everything that's in the node set file that's part of namespace zero would be present in, in a server. And however, if you think about all of the technology that's exposed by the OPC UA base specs, we have alarms and events, data access, historical access, we have programs and state machines and and complex data types and many functionalities that uh, in reality most servers only implement a small fraction of all of the nodes and namespace node information that we we provide in OPC UA specifications so in version 105 we've introduced this new feature that allows the ability for a server to only expose nodes, type nodes mostly, but nodes in general, uh, that they actually use and support based on the profiles that they uh, support in their in their products. So if you remember, um, the, the conformance testing in OPC UA is done with the notion where we have this high level thing called profiles, and profiles can contain other profiles and smaller pieces called facets. And all profiles and facets effectively collect together uh, a series of conformance units. And a conformance unit is a, is a testable thing that tests one thing uh, th that is required uh, for that profile. So the collection of conformance units is what you have to conform to uh, to, to, to meet the certification process. So in, in 105, we have this ability uh, to subset the nodes uh, in the address space to be a subset of those that are in the node set file based on the actual functionality that, that is uh, included in your server. We've added this feature by including a new heading in a new row in each of the node definition tables in all of our specifications to indicate the exact conformance unit that will test the functionality of having the, that particular node in the address space. So in this case, I've taken an example of a 3D vector type defined in part five, and you can see this now specifies that the conformance unit that would require the 3D vector type to appear in a server's address space is called base info spatial data. And that particular conformance unit will test the 3D vector and a few other of these spatial uh, data types. But the point is that if you are not attempting to support and conform to a profile that includes the base info spatial data conformance unit, you do not have to have the 3D vector type in your address space. And so we have added this information to every single node definition table in all of the OPC UA 1.05 specifications. And so, and this of course begins in part five, you see many of these types like this one is from part five, but of course part eight and nine and 12 and 13, 14, and so forth, all, all of the other follow-on parts, most of the follow-on parts include node definition, and they will now all have this particular information in them. Now, now this new feature and the, and the ability to optimize um, a server by only including uh, the subset of nodes required for your, that are actually going to be used in the server is in fact backwards compatible because of course it's it's never wrong to have nodes in the address space that, that you don't otherwise use. So any 104 server is an example that currently or continues to expose the entire address space is not incorrect. However, going forward, 
you'll find 105 servers that will only have nodes in the address space that conform to their actual functionality. So after we begin um, releasing formally the, the 105 releases, uh, where there are changes that we're making to how we do releases, wh what we do for uh, when we add functionality and so forth. Um, so as part of this process, we're eliminating what we used to publish as errata and amendments. Uh, we used to publish uh, corrections to specifications in a separate document called errata, and we used to publish uh, enhancements and, and uh, new functionality uh, to parts as, as, as amendments. And we're eliminating both of those going forward, starting with version 105. So you'll see new parts come in any time in the process. You'll see existing parts with either what would have been errata or amendment functionality be released with the uh, added functions right away. So you, even though we've just released 105.0, I'll pick on an example in part five, there could be a 105.1 version of part five that comes out in three months. And again, we're eliminating these, these other parts of other types of documents and, and updating the actual specs much more frequently than the past. Um, there's no real change in, in how often we're releasing technology, how often we're releasing fixes. There's no change in how version numbers get assigned with the node sets and so forth. It's just a simplified process where we just deal with the, the actual documents, publish them more frequently, and we have the online reference that will now always match the latest released versions of the specifications. So that's it. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I want you to wish you to have a, a good time with the rest of the presentations. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, Tim. Appreciate all your information and details. And uh, for me, it's uh, most critical that OPCA is always compatible to all the previous versions that a today client, a modern client from the year 2021 or next years can still connect to devices which have been, uh, been on the market in the year 2006, seven, right? Okay. Thank you for that. And also for staying online at this time, it uh, must be roughly about, uh, 2 a.m. for you, and uh, so please stay online also for the Q&A sessions later. The next speaker is about the OPCA FX uh, specification extensions. We had a short overview from Peter Lutz yesterday, but now we provide more detailed information from the both architects. We have Georg from Siemens here and Greg from Rockwell Automation, and I'm handing over to you, please. Good morning. My name is Georg Bieler, and I want to give you an update about OPC UAFX. To avoid confusion about the names, OPC UAFLC stands for the initiative, abbreviation for field level communication, and OPC UAFX stands for the name of the specification which is released by the field level communication initiative. A note, FLC or OPC UA FLC is an integral part of OPC UA. Our specification consists of five parts, which are part of the OPC UA base specification. Part 80 will cover overview and concepts, part 81 connecting devices and information model, 82 networking, 83 offline engineering, and 84 profiles. For our first release, we will cover the controller to controller use case. We finalize the release candidate 1 by end of April and are currently working on the release candidate 2. In parallel, the prototyping working group is implementing what was covered in RC1 and what is currently discussed in RC2. By end of August, we will bring the RC2 into a member review, and by end of November, it expected, we expect to have 
B version 1.0 ready for release. Later on, beginning in December, we will then continue with the work on the controlled device use case. Let's shortly cover the core pieces of OPC ReFX. You may have heard of it already in the webinar we gave in last December or in the podcast, which is also available on the OPC UA Foundation webpage. A central core piece of OPC UAFX is the information model. We are harmonizing access to asset information and access to functional information inside an automation component, which allows then a tool from outside to get a uniform access to information in the automation components. And that is independent of whether the automation component is a device or is a controller, is a drive, a PLC, or a temperature sensor, or belongs to factory or process automation. The asset model describes the world of things, which could be physical things like a module or a connector or a pin, or could also be software thermal licenses. It offers a uniform access to nameplate information, like which vendor it, uh, the product built, which firmware version it has, serial number, whatever. It allows to assign tags to the asset, and it supports verification whether an asset is compatibility, compatible to my expectation or not. The asset model is based on OPC UA device integration, part 100 of the OPC UA specification series, and the asset model allows the extension of existing companion specs. The functional model describes the world of functionality, which could be as simple as a digital input or temperature sensor, just offering data, or as complex as a drive. Functional entity supports identity verification. It supports semantics, data types, security, etc. And it supports real-time data exchange. And again, a functional model allows extending existing companion specs. Again, PADM or whatever companion specs we have out there. The second core piece, logical connections. Logical connections are serving for the data exchange between functional entities. Logical connections are established by a connection manager. So somebody out here, which could be an external station or could be integrated in one of the automation components, is establishing that data exchange. Establishing logical connection includes the verification of each of the connection endpoints are the assets we expected once, are the functional entities we expected once I want to connect. It allows you to get ownership over, for example, the input data or configuration data. It allows you to configure the application behavior of that functional entity, and it allows you to persist connections so that automatically of the power cycle, the connection is re-established without the need of someone establishing a connection from outside, like the connection manager. A logical connection is built to exchange data. Currently, we are in, uh, building the data on top of OPC UA PubSub which is covered in the base specification part 14. We allow to exchange normal data and safety data 
We are allowed to secure the data, like to, to authenticate it or to encrypt it. We support quality of service, like priority up to deadline, including time-sensitive network, including a mapping to time-sensitive networks. Data exchange can be built on various transport, like naked layer 2 PDUs or UDP framing, up to MQTT and AMQP. And we allow to monitor connections. So, but if one of the connection endpoints detects that it doesn't get enough input data, it will stop producing output data or issuing output data. The last core piece is offline engineering. We developed the concept of a descriptor. The descriptor itself describes capabilities, functionality, configuration, and assets of an automation component. In fact, it describes the asset model, it describes the functional model, what we've seen on the previous slides. Offline descriptor is an essential part for development, commissioning, operation, and maintenance phases of an automation system. The descriptor starts by uh, with the vendor making a product, he will fill in some information, and through the various steps of the life cycle of an automation component, the descriptor is enriched with information through the various steps. Like a PLC vendor will offer a product descriptor for its PLC, a machine builder will add functional entities to that PLC and will produce another descriptor uh, or will enrich the product descriptor of a PLC vendor with his information and so on. The descriptor is built on the open packaging convention document and it allows to package various files, modeling files, including attachment files. It allows to build relationships between the files and it allows to signal, assign the descriptor to prove the validness of information. Model files will be based on automation amounts and attachments allow to integrate whatever files you have here. So the open packaging convention document is like a zip file. It allows to, for example, add documents, manuals, drawings, etc. So what I told up to now is mostly covered in RC1 and the RC1 specification. So what is our current focus for RC2? Actually consists of five main topics. Profiles, safety, security, time-sensitive networks, and we will, last but not least, include feedback from prototyping, which is really valuable to improve our specification. What about profiles? All OPC VFX devices, or actually automation components, controllers, devices, whatever, will be conformance tested. And the profiles define the specific groupings of functionality that will be tested. The crux for a profile, as usual, is on one hand to ensure interoperability in a multi vendor environment, which tends to a small number of profiles like one or two or whatever, but still provide vendors with implementation flexibility, which tends to a large number of profile. And the real challenge here is to find a balance between these competing goals. And in RC2 profiles, since our first specification will cover the controller to controller use case, profiles will be defined for controllers and for the connection manager functionality. As you may already know, OPC safety part 15 defines safety communication. The safety working group is currently in the process extending their 
up to now based on client server communication, extending it with a mapping to PubSub based on part 14 of the base specification. This extension, or actually the complete OPCA safety communication standard, is currently in member review. Safety works in a way that the safety consumer is communicating with the safety provider. Safety provider would, for example, be an emergency stop button or a light curtain or some safety component. The safety consumer issues a request SPDU to a safety provider containing protocol information, which requests the safety provider to provide a new set of safety data to the safety consumer, which is included in the response SPDU. Response SPDU contains safety data plus protocol data. In the information model, the safety provider is modeled inside the safety information model, having parameters and the PDUs which we have seen here up there. The request PDU and the response PDU. If we now combine safety of FX, mean safety variables, speaking the request SPDU and the response SPDU, are also organized by the input data and the output data of the functional entity. So both safety provider and functional entity input data point to the same instance of a base data variable. Meaning functional entity may now specify safety and non-safety variables in parallel and connections, which we have seen uh, on a slide before, may exchange safety and non-safety data in parallel. We may even include multiple safety providers or consumers in, at one time. Security, the next extension or the next topic in our RC2 progress of the specification. Security is what we do as FX, we will use the security features provided with the OPC UI based specification, meaning authorization, authentication, and encryption. And with actually three areas where we will apply the security features, one area is client server communication. Client server communication will be used for accessing data in the information model, plain, I would say plain or PCUA base, a commun a communication or base security. And we will use role-based security, especially for example, for the connection manager, when he will establish the connections. The connection manager will use normal client server communication to establish connections, but the connection manager is a service. It's not a human person. So what we need as extension is new non-human roles, which we have to define. Regarding PubSub, we will base our security model, or we will base it purely on what is specified in part 14 in the PubSub base communication specification. And we will support the pull and the push model, which is defined there. Take a look at the concept section of part 40. PubSub will use symmetric keys for real time purposes to avoid a long time for encryption or decryption. However, if you use a symmetric key too often, you have to renew it. And for the renewing of the symmetric keys, you need a security key server or abbreviated as SKS. We will profile it in a way that the connection manager will also act, or actually the device where the connection manager is, is sitting on as a service, will act in addition as a security key server as defined by Part 14. And last but not least, 
the offline descriptor, as we've seen above, will use also security features like signing or encryption. Last but not least, for RC2 time sensitive networks, abbreviated as TSM. TSM depends on outcome in various IEEE working groups, which will unfortunately not be available in our release timeframe. For example, the outcome of the 6002 profile working group, which defines an automation profile over TSM, or various young modules are not defined. Wherefore, we defined three meaningful steps towards full support of TSN in OPC UEFX. The first one is network only TSN, which will provide with RC2. The second one is offline engineered static TSN, meaning offline engineered streams. And the last one is plug and produce TSN, meaning online engineered streams. Both will be covered in future releases. For network-only TSN, an end station component may still use its traditional Ethernet interface, but has to add the priority tagging of Ethernet priority, meaning PCP, or IP priority, meaning DSCP, when injecting the frames. The bridge components are set up with a 6802 aligned TSM bridge capability definition, meaning the bridge components are set up using timer mirror shaper windows and or preemption. And for the network services, we expect to be either RSTP or MSTP there. We need still to decide that. We expect to have LLDP and 802AS for a uh, working clock synchronization to establish the time aware shaper windows within the TSN domain. That's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attendance. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. Here is my email address and my telephone number. If you look for more information, navigate to opcfoundation.org slash FLC to get white papers and brochures. And also go into the concept sections of the FLC specification series to get more information. Thank you so much, Georg, for the excellent presentation. Um, I like to remind the audience uh, that at the end of this year in November, we will have the SPS show where we strongly believe this will happen as a physical show. Um, the situation with vaccine is uh, uh, looks like that, that everybody who wants to get a, a vaccine shot will have received one in August, September, and that's why we are very um, sure that there will be a physical trade show. And I, I'm really looking forward and, and can't wait to see the first live demonstration of OPCUA FX. And I believe this is really a um, fantastic time also for Peter Lutz and the complete team, the largest ecosystem in the world for this um, field level communications um, a group to, to, to go live and, and have a first demo. i like to remind the group, uh, please use our Q&A uh, chat window. Um, we don't receive a lot of questions right now. Um, all the speakers are online and like to answer your questions and get in discussion with you. So please take the opportunity. This is why you are live here. Uh, participate in the Q&A, um, otherwise you could obviously just listen to the recording without any further explanations. Yes, we are providing the recording later on, uh, also uh, the, the slide decks, but we highly ask you be interactive and ask questions. For me, it's a pleasure to announce the next speaker. 
It's uh, Eric Banchet from Microsoft. I think he will introduce himself. Uh, he has a lot of uh, uh, titles and positions where he is active. Um, obviously, you know him from multiple OPC days already as a speaker. He is our cloud person, um, not only knowing about cloud, definitely not, but, but uh, his focus obviously is how to collect data from assets and move them up into IT cloud systems and back. Um, it's a pleasure for me to have you online here, Erich. Uh, you will also do a nice workshop uh, next week at the Achema, uh, which you can explain later on how you do in a 45-minute workshop um, explaining how to connect assets to Azure, Microsoft Azure in one hour. But okay, that's a challenge. Um, I'm handing over now to you uh, and looking forward to your presentation, Erich. Thank you, Stefan. So first of all, thanks for inviting me back to OPC Day. This is now, uh, I think, my seventh OPC Day in a row, um, which is which is great. Um, you know, I'm I'm definitely always excited to share the latest developments that you know we've made as an organization, specifically when it comes to cloud technology. So obviously, we're focusing on this uh, at Microsoft. Um, when using OPC OA and um, today, uh, let me just start my presentation. I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, some practical guide uh, on how to avoid vendor lock-in. Obviously, OPC OA is very suitable for avoiding vendor lock-in because it's an IEC standard. Um, I have now a new role. Um, it's um, Eric. Sorry. Can you switch to the presenter mode? Uh, I thought I was. Let me just switch. You mean like so? Yep. Okay. Um, I've actually switched roles within Microsoft. I'm now the Chief Architect for Standards and Consortia uh, for uh, Microsoft Azure IoT. Um, as part of that, I represent Microsoft in various different standards organizations and consortia, including obviously the OPC Foundation, the Platform Industry 4.0, and um, the um, IIC in the US. Um, today, again, um, I'm going to focus really on giving practical advice on, on uh, how to use OPC OA in the cloud. So vendor lock-in is something that you know you should be familiar with. Um, I've talked about it many times before, um, but just uh, as a summary, it you know vendor lock-in means that you're locked into a specific vendor because they force you to use a you know an, a closed source SDK or a proprietary interface. Uh, proprietary communication, or in fact, um, what happens a lot, uh, proprietary data model. Um, also, sometimes it can be more subtle. Sometimes they talk about um, running particular software on a specific set of hardware or data center. Um, that's also lock-in. Um, so whenever you see things like that being um, communicated to you, be careful. Um, you need to evaluate if if the solution is worth it for you, or if you would prefer a solution where you know you can leave and use a different solution at any time. So, in general, um, obviously we've been using OPC Way for a long time. Um, really, we've uh, started integrating OPC Way in 2014. We launched our first. OPC Way based product in 2016, but we've really been part of the OPC Foundation since 1996, uh, since the beginning, really. And the reason why we think OPC Way is so suitable for cloud solutions is because it gives you interoperability, it gives you, um, you know, data modeling capabilities, and it also gives you built in best in class security. So, OPC OA doesn't actually define the data model itself. It only defines how data should be modeled. The data models actually come from the industry, from the ecosystem. Obviously, the VDMA is doing a lot of 
um, data models right now for the different machine types, but it's not exclusive to the VDMA. There's many other organizations that are um, building um, OPC way information models that then allow you to build standardized software based on those data models also in the cloud. So one of the ones I'm currently uh, involved with is, uh, you know, I'm working on a carbon capture and storage project uh, in Norway called Northern Lights. And um, one of the most suitable um, data models for Northern Lights is in fact MDIS, which is, um, you know, um, a data model for the so-called master control station, which is the thing that sits on the ocean floor in the carbon capture and storage project. In fact, we're pumping CO2 through that master control station um, underground, um, secured, per, uh, stored permanently underground, um, you know, in, in the rock formations uh, on the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, as you can see, many, many companies are involved in the MDIS standard and you know, with a with a multi-company project like Northern Lights, it's it's super important to actually you know base the solution on open standards, so you have that built-in interoperability. Okay, I put this slide in because I get a lot of questions regarding the different consortia and the different organizations that are kind of doing industry for all solutions and and how they all fit together. So I put this together mainly as an overview. Um, obviously, there are a number of input organizations that contribute to the platform industry for O, and you see them there, the Bitcom, ZVI, the VDMA that I mentioned before that are building the companion specs, obviously the OPC Foundation and also the Automation ML Consortium, and they all give input to the platform industry for O. And the platform industry for O then makes recommendations, a reference architecture, um, and a um, small set of standards that they recommend for industry for all solutions. And then there are the user organizations that are actually using the recommendations from the platform, and there's many of them. In fact, um, you get a lot more of these as industry for all solutions become more uh, popular. Uh, here are just a few that are you know, the most um, popular, the, 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 the ones that are currently the busiest, let's say, uh, next week at Akama Pulse, we're going to hear more about Namur and how they're using OPCOA. Um, but there's many other ones um, out there that that can be used. Um, and of course, it's it's important to kind of know: is it a user organization? Is it a standards organization? I didn't even mention the standards organizations like the IEC. Uh, or Oasis here, but obviously um, it's it's very confusing if if you're not involved with these organizations on a daily basis. So uh, I thought I'd put this better. So regarding the reference architecture that uh, the Platform Industry for O um, put together, it's called Rami, um, and as you can see, it's kind of a three-dimensional um, architecture, and for the um, production and maintenance use. Um, OPC OA is set also on the information model and the communication layer. So, um, you know, towards the uh, cloud, towards the connected world, that is OPC OA pops up. And, you know, OPC OA pops up is what I'm going to be talking about mainly going uh, in the next few minutes. So, in terms of the asset administration shell, which is one of the things that the platform industry for O has defined together with the ZVI, it's mainly a data sharing service. So people get very confused when they hear asset admin shell, what is it? It's, it's mainly a data sharing service. It also defines a um, file format, like a, like a container format. It's actually using the OpenOffice XML format. Um, and you know it's currently being turned into an IEC standard. And there's a mapping to OPC UA, but most importantly, when you're creating an asset admin shell around an OPC UA enabled asset, it's important to keep the OPC UA information model intact so you can use that OPC UA information model um, at the receiving end, right? And to do that, you need to um, create an asset admin shell from an OPC UA node set file, which is the file format, obviously, for um, OPC UA um, 
information models. And how to do that, um, I put together, sorry, I put together a, um, a demo open source. It's on GitHub. I've linked it down here. So this is also an important step towards leveraging the asset admin shell with OPC UA. So now to, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the practical steps and what you can do to avoid vendor lock-in. And specifically, you know, what questions should you ask yourself when you're starting an industrial IoT project? So here are the five questions. And you know, um, I'll go into each one of them in detail now. One of the things you should know is, you know, the the transport protocol, which is what most people tend to uh, spend time on, is is largely irrelevant, right? I mean, OPC Way is transport protocol independent, as you probably know, and you know, um, MQTT is one of them, which which um, can be used. And there's a defined mapping um, specified in the OPC uh, specification, but you can use any protocol you want, really. And uh, what's more important than the protocol to use, it's the data format and the data model. So let's go straight on it, in, into it. And here's the first question. So what data model should you pick, right? And, you know, people, you know, a few years ago said, yeah, data is the new oil and data is so important. I tend to disagree. I think it's the data model that is actually the most important choice when you're doing an um, industrial IoT project. And really, you want to pick a data model that's based on an IEC standard, like OPC UA, because that gives you vendor independence. And you know, when a certain solution asks you to model your asset again, be careful. Alarm bells should be ringing because it means that the data model that that particular solution uses is proprietary, right? Much better is, I mean, you know, we can't always build all software using open standards. I get that, right? But at least you should be able to import a data model based on an open standard and then also read the data out again in an open standard, even if the internal storage of that data and data model is, is proprietary. That's fine. However, standard data in, standard data out, and that's what you should be looking for. And also, I mean, people tend to confuse the word open with standard. I mean, lots of people um, think that once they open source something, it becomes magically a standard. It doesn't work that way, right? So. A standard is released by a standards organization. So if it's not, if it doesn't have an IEC uh, number or a number from OASIS, it's not a standard, right? It's still proprietary, even though it's open source, right? So be careful there. Uh, there's a lot of confusion that some people are generating right now with that. So the next question you should ask yourself is, um, you know, where do you want to do your data normalization? So guess what? When you're doing cloud analytics, all your data should be in the same format, right? Otherwise, cloud analytics becomes super complicated, right? Um, so where do you do that data conversion? And the best place to do that is as early as possible in your telemetry pipeline, which means on premises, right? On the edge, that's where your data conversion should happen. And I mean, it's also, you know, a lot simpler to convert data from different sources on the edge because chances are on that particular edge installation on premises in your plant or in your factory, you have the subject subject matter experts that actually can explain to you what data um, the data represents or what, what formats in and, and what assets sit behind it or what database or whatever it may be. Um, they're usually on-prem. They're right there in the factory and that's where um, you know, you have the best success of making sense of the data. The other thing that you should ask yourself is, you know, what telemetry format would you pick, right? Because, um, you know, ever so often you, you get these industry IT experts, you know, on YouTube or whatnot, and they, they come up with this new hip and trendy, super efficient, oh, if we've tried it on a Raspberry Pi and it works great, you know, data format, well, it doesn't matter, right? Because if it's not in a in an open format, 
that is also readily available from cloud services, uh, you'll have to convert the data in the cloud again, right? And another thing that happens a lot is that, you know, you, you convert your data on the edge in that super efficient format, you send it to the cloud, and then you need to convert it back to something that the cloud services or the cloud databases actually understand, right? And all of this you have to pay for, and it adds zero value, right? So it's much better to convert your data once on the edge into a standard format, and that format should be something that the cloud readily understands. And believe me, you know, actually sending data to the cloud these days is cheap, but the conversion of data, especially if it has to happen in the cloud at scale, can cost you a lot of money very quickly. And again, it's, it's money wasted. So then the next one is how much scale do you actually need? I mean, a lot of the times this is easier done um, in a small project where scale doesn't really you know, make that big of a difference. But as you, you know, go into production with a project, you know, it, it tends to be difficult to, to scale it out if you haven't thought about what services you're gonna use for that scale out from the start. And I mean, really what you want to do is use services that auto scale, right? Where you don't need to worry about, you know, is it you know, wasting resources right now because you've made the, you know, compute too big or is it is it actually, you know, bursting at the seams and, you know, you're dropping data because you can't process it fast enough. So these auto scale services um, are really handy that, you know, it only, it only really, um, you know, um, scales as you need it. And you really should think about some of the use cases that you have um, up front as well, because again, you know, once you build your scalable architecture, if you have your use case in mind, um, it becomes a lot easier. So then the last question is, do you need to integrate third-party systems? And, you know, chances are, yes, you do, right? I mean, you know, not all the data is in one place in your factory, right? Um, it's, it's usually spread in various different data silos, right? And each one of them need to be integrated. And, you know, when it comes to historian integration, you wanna bulk upload that data. You don't wanna, you know, stream the data. So uh, you need different um, upload mechanisms to your, to your cloud solution, right? And you need to build that in upfront. And again, ERP systems are, are usually also very proprietary and it's important to, you know, plan the integration of the ERP systems up front so there aren't any surprises halfway through the project, right? And I'm speaking from experience here. So again, um, it's important to plan ahead, choose services that can read data from multiple different sources and process, process it, right? And it's important to, to keep that scale in mind as well. So now very quickly about you know this this whole OPC way versus MQTT, um, which is which is a hot topic um, in, on LinkedIn and and everywhere else. Um, you know, like I mentioned, OPC way is protocol independent. MQTT is first and foremost a transport protocol, right? So, you know, you really need to um, get off the idea that you know OPC way competes with MQTT. It doesn't, right? It leverages it and has been doing that for many, many years, right? That's in part 14 of the spec. Um, at Microsoft, we've been using it since 2015. We found it super efficient. And, you know, it also, um, you know, together with the OPC way pops up, JSON encoding requires no conversion of the data in the cloud. You can feed that JSON pops up data straight into cloud databases or analytics software, which is super um, efficient and has great benefits as I've already highlighted. And of course, it's an IEC standard now, so it doesn't lock you in. Okay, so the Microsoft Industrial IT stack, um, not much has changed here. Some of the servers have been updated, um, but in general, um, if you haven't seen this before, obviously the Industrial IT stack is split into layers. At the bottom, you have your infrastructure, your, you know, VMs, your networking, 
um, your user management, all of that. On top of that, you have your um, managed services, which are again, you know, vertical independent. They are um, generally uh, generally applicable to many different use cases. And you have your IoT Edge, your Hub, your Data Explorer, and and Data Lake, and all of those things in there. Um, and again, Microsoft carries the beeper. You don't need to worry about you know keeping that service up and running. Microsoft does that for you, right? And then on top of that, we built our industrial IoT platform, open source, based on OPCOA. It's all on GitHub, right? And you know that gives you that interoperability and avoids lock-in. And some folks prefer to actually, you know, have a you know shrink-wrapped solution. They just need to, you know, um, create an account. They get a login and use the solution the way it is, and that's called software as a service. That sits on top of that, right? So Examples of that are Time Series Insights uh, with its own dashboard, IoT Central, Power BI, which is a no-code dashboarding solution. So all of that is available from Microsoft. And of course, as we have a huge partner ecosystem, um, they are also leveraging those layers. Um, they pick one and, and leverage it. Um, they can leverage multiple layers at once, of course. And they are the ones, sorry, excuse me, they're the ones that build the you know, specific services uh, for for the industrial use cases and managed applications as well. So, you know, um, the SAP Cloud or PTC ThingWorks, um, you know, Siemens Mindsphere, they are great examples of some of the partners that we have running on this. Okay, so what does this industrial IT pipeline that I mentioned actually look like? Well, um, this is it. Um, so you have your assets on the left, on-prem, sometimes these are aggregating assets, so there's multiple physical machines connected to a single uh, aggregating asset, like an OPC way aggregation server, um, or it's just a plain OPC server, right? That can happen as well quite a lot these days. More and more people build OPC way directly into the machines, which is great, right? And then obviously you have some sort of gateway running on-prem that are sending uh, data then to the cloud gateway. Uh, then again, because we're using PubSub, you can connect your time series database directly to the cloud gateway, no data conversion required. And then um, you can have your analytics software um, run queries against your time series database. Or um, if you want to create that digital feedback loop, you have um, you know serverless compute uh, services like Azure uh, Functions can also run queries um, directly on a time series database or in fact on the on the analytics software and then via IoT hub methods um, you know which again translated back into OPC way method calls you can have uh, your digital feedback loop back into the asset and unfortunately almost everybody else not everybody else but almost everybody else still uses a completely uh, proprietary telemetry pipeline, right? And that's the big differentiator that, you know, Microsoft Azure Industry IT has. We use OPC way as, to the best of its capabilities, right? And, you know, again, um, you know, as OPC way pops up is extended with new features, we, we built them in. Um, there's a bit of a but here. Data is meaningless without context. So where does the context come from, obviously the context comes from the OPC way information model. And that's what the missing piece is. And that's why we created the OPC way cloud library working group to allow data model upload to the cloud that can then be used through queries, um, which are also going to be standardized um, through OPC way um, for that telemetry pipeline. And there's another session um, today specifically on the cloud library it's it's been uh running as a collaboration with with the clean energy and smart manufacturing innovation institute in the us um so we're going to hear about that in detail later on so this may come as a shock to you but not every machine or plc out there supports opc way out of the box yet right so you're going to have to use industrial um, connectivity software, right? The good news is that Microsoft has been doing 
um, you know, uh, partnerships with connectivity software providers for a long, long time, and you know the um, the list of of modules that are available in the Azure Marketplace keeps growing. Here's here's a, a snapshot, and uh, we're very proud to have the largest ecosystem of partners with for industrial IoT software, all of which are providing an OPC UA interface to us. And again, you can check out the marketplace for for um, a list. So very quickly, what does um, you know a simple connectivity telemetry pipeline look like on Azure? Well, here it is. Like I mentioned, you know, if your asset supports OPC way out of the box, you can connect OPC Publisher, which is open source on GitHub. Um, you know, straight away. Otherwise, you need that connectivity adapter, connectivity software from the Azure Marketplace. Um, OPC Publisher runs inside of Azure IoT Edge as a Docker container, and then Azure IoT Edge gives you um, store and forward capabilities. So if you have a you know unreliable internet connection, that's taken care of, and then you just have sorry here. You just have a um, IoT hub as a cloud gateway in the cloud. So that's connectivity. So then, how does condition monitoring um, look in addition to connectivity? Obviously, condition monitoring leverages connectivity. Well, the only thing you really need on top of that is a OPC way enabled cloud dashboard. And we're going to release such a cloud dashboard uh, open source at Acuma Pulse next week. And then in terms of predictive maintenance, well, not a lot needs to change either. All you really need is um, you know, a time series database with analytics capabilities and Azure Data Explorer does that for you. And I've blogged about this on LinkedIn. Sorry, I blogged about this on LinkedIn a while ago. Um, so this is definitely um, something that um, is easily achieved and you can just read the blog post there. So what does the entire architecture look like, including what is needed for digital feedback loop. Well, here it is. Um, obviously, it's a bit more complicated, but you know, um, it's not rocket science. You can connect this up in um, a few days. Um, these um, OPC services are all open source on GitHub. Uh, they run on Kubernetes. Um, they're Docker containers. And you know, Synapse is our um, analytics um, PaaS service, and of course, if you want long-term storage, which of course is a good idea um, to store your telemetry data long-term, you have Azure Data Lake available as well. And then for for the for the apps, you can of course use your own dashboards or Power BI or a combination of both. So then, in summary, you know um, you probably know this this kind of step-by-step -step, uh, diagram. You know, the main message here is don't get locked into to a proprietary vendor solution. Use open standards, and Microsoft supplies that open standard-based platform. And you know, we we can help you at every step and um, and make you successful in your industrial IoT project. And with that, I am at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Erich. Appreciate uh, your presentation, great details. You already mentioned that uh, we are talking in more detail about the uh, collaboration with SESME, and I know that you are playing a key role there as a um, chair of that uh, joint working group. So it's a pleasure for me now to invite uh, Jonathan Wise as a speaker and to give us some more detail about this uh, specific collaboration with Sesme. I think mostly here in Europe and Asia, we, we always believe the joint working group is describing the semantic for an asset which you can touch, right? The, the robot, the RFID reader. This is what we learned all the last years. And that's why it's uh, now a pleasure to learn more about this UA for Cloud Library. What does it mean in detail and what are the use cases? So, uh, Jonathan, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Jonathan Wise. I'm the VP of Technology at SESME, the Smart Manufacturing Institute. 
Today, I get to provide an update on one of our efforts with the OPC Foundation and some of its key members. But before I do, just a few words about our organization. SESME is one of the Manufacturing USA Institutes that were created to improve US competitiveness in manufacturing and help accelerate important ideas in this space globally. SESME is funded by the US federal government and was kicked off in 2017. We're a public-private partnership delivering over 140 million in investment over five years. We use that funding as the voice of manufacturing. We're not a vendor, we don't have a product to sell, we engage the ecosystem through a membership model and fund projects that as, a, as an organization, we determine will advance the state of the art in US manufacturing. Our overarching goal is to accelerate the democratization of smart manufacturing. Our strategy towards that goal is to direct our funding in three main areas. Technology projects aim to decrease the cost and complexity of adopting smart manufacturing concepts by identifying reusable patterns and scalable technology that can support all manufacturers from small to large. We advocate for and invest in approaches that are interoperable and standards-based and create real tangible value for manufacturers to improve their decision-making throughput and efficiency. Our knowledge investments aim to enhance the manufacturing workforce, empowering a data-driven culture and a smart ecosystem that harnesses both OT and IT technology. We do this through hands-on training, curriculum development, and partnerships with academia. And finally, our innovation projects advance the state of the art. They encompass new research that accelerates the adoption of new technology in an open and interoperable fashion, going after some of the toughest problems in manufacturing with an approach that is free of vendor lock-in or expensive infrastructure projects. In going after some of these challenges, especially as we maintain a focus on repeatability and reusability, we have the opportunity to engage with some industry thought leaders. Our decisions are based on input from SESME members, and we bring that input to other organizations with similar goals. In 2020, while working with the Microsoft and OPC Foundation, we identified a missing piece in the OPC UA stack that we wanted to address, and we were excited about the level of enthusiasm we were met with when we brought it up. So together we kicked off a joint working group to build a rather unique companion specification for OPC UA. You can see from the list of participants, we're not the only ones with this pain point. The team is made up of some of the most influential thought leaders in our space. And as you can imagine, our working group meetings are lively and full of interesting discussion. As a group, we focus that discussion on something we call the cloud library. The cloud library is a repository of reusable UA information models, and it supports a wide variety of use cases, and I'll talk through a few of them today. In the first set of scenarios, we imagine information models being useful independent of a running server. This could be because the machine that serves the data hasn't been commissioned yet, or it may be that the machine has been commissioned and it's been shipped to a customer or deployed remotely in a location with only intermittent connectivity. In these situations, the information model acts as a proxy for the machine or system, allowing applications to understand the structure of the data in the abstract and providing a point of reference to interact with for pre or post uh, commissioning situations. In the second set of use cases, we imagine a machine that is being built or commissioned and the implementer needs to validate what they're building against some point of reference. In some cases, there may be a formal reference specification to work against, but in many cases, systems can be very ad hoc or standards may not exist or may still be evolving. Being able to look up a reference information model provides an approach to validation that supports both human and programmatic evaluation. The third set of scenarios is similar, except instead of building a machine, we might be building an app. The app developer needs to create an information model that their app will work around. Rather than starting from scratch, they can search a central repository to find what models already exist and then derive from, extend, or even directly apply those models to the tool they're building. The final scenario I'll talk about today is one that SESME is particularly passionate about. Here in the US, the vast majority of our manufacturing runs on existing infrastructure. Manufacturers wanna take advantage of modern technology like OPC UA, but they don't wanna rip and replace their existing systems. A repository of information models for common equipment and processes can provide a map 
that we can bind those systems to. It abstracts the brownfield system into a more modern information interface by pulling from a repository of things that have already been published. Of course, we can solve all of these problems today. We can do it with or without a UA information model, but having a common language and a central location to publish to or search within uh, accelerates implementations. It keeps us from having to reinvent the wheel over and over again every time we find a system we've seen before or resorting to less than optimal approaches to building and sharing information models. I got permission from one of the working group members to illustrate a great way to tackle this today. Here I'm showing a model design tool called UMX Pro uh, from an outfit called Beyond. And I'm looking at a blank slate or almost a blank slate. Like with any UA project, I never have to start from nothing. I have the base namespace and all the constructs that exist within it. But in this scenario, imagine I have a robot that I want to model. And robots aren't part of UA namespace zero. So I'd like to know if there are any standards or implementations already out there for robots. So I don't have to invent the model myself. So I'm going to head to Google and I'm going to search to see what's out there. And in this case, I'm going to get really lucky. An organization called BDMA has expertly defined a robot information model. They've developed a UA companion spec for it. And then they've published that as a portable node set file which fortunately the OPC Foundation has made available on their GitHub. So I've got everything I need. I can download this model, I can import it into UMX Pro, and I can benefit from the work that others have done. Unfortunately, this idealized scenario only works for a small number of situations. There's only a few of these published. Building a companion spec is not a simple task. And the list of available node sets is, is pretty small given the size of our industry. It's not fair to interpret our goal as building a GitHub for node sets, but there is some of that crowdsourced, innovative open source juice that we want to enable with the cloud library. So the cloud library companion spec addresses this scenario and the other use cases I described. For this diagram, I've chosen to describe any person or code that wants to find information models as a consumer, generically, only because the word client has another meaning. A consumer can be an OPC UA client. It could also be an OPC UA server, or it could be literally anything that can make a REST call that would benefit from a repository of pre-built information models. That's because these UA information models truly are portable and they can be used anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be within a UA ecosystem. Sheffield University's Advanced Manufacturing Research Center recently demonstrated how you can leverage UA information models as the foundation for their Factory Plus system that uses MQTT as the underlying comms protocol. So we can use these things anywhere if we had a place to go find them. Regardless of who or what this consumer is, the cloud library supports them by exposing a REST style API uh, with a few interfaces. These interfaces support uh, searching for interface, inter information models, uh, including like a fuzzy search where I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, but I want to look at the model metadata. Um, it's going to support commerce. So there's the possibility that you may want to monetize information models you've built. It supports downloading a node space or an address space once you've found it and uploading an address space that you've created that you want to share with others. And then it optionally supports that validation scenario where I have an, an information model and I want to validate what I have on board against some reference point. If we project forward a little what this might look like in the future, I uh, took some liberties and mocked up how it might be integrated into a tool like UMX Pro to seamlessly engage information modelers in that tool with a community that has published models for reuse. At SESB, we're imagining not just large-scale comprehensive models like BDMA has built, but also smaller reusable component models that can provide information interfaces for subsets of data, like energy analysis, that could work across a wide range of otherwise dissimilar machines and systems. Microsoft's imagining using the cloud library across their IoT ecosystem, accelerating the instantiation of asset UA servers that can quickly identify themselves against published information models 
and auto configure data flow analysis and actions in Azure. And SESME members are bringing their own software technology and contributing to an open platform that embraces information models across the stack, not just for instantiating objects that are strongly typed against a reference, but also these information models become the API for app development. And through, through an extension we're working on, also become a mechanism for binding object instances to other protocols. Finally, making it easy to leverage apps independent of a particular vendor ecosystem or platform. We call those combined uses of an evolved UA node set, the smart manufacturing profile. And we're actively funding tools to simplify the creation, reuse, and application of these profiles across our smart manufacturing projects. I'm happy to share that we plan to be one of the first to implement the cloud library specification that we're working on and making it available as a resource for the manufacturing community. So if that's the vision, today my job is to report on our current progress towards it. Last month, our initial draft of our companion spec was presented to the OPC Foundation's Technical Control Board and accepted as a release candidate with a few follow-up actions that the team is taking to address their input. Three members of the joint, work, joint working group have signed up to do prototype development with the support of the OPC Foundation. My team at SESME, Microsoft, and InRay will be doing the bulk of the development for these prototypes, but with guidance and input from the broader group. And together, we'll iterate on exactly what the API payload responses look like um, so we can document that, and then making some other improvements to the specification. We're really excited about the progress we've made in a relatively short amount of time, and we're pushing towards uh, an initial availability later this year. If all this makes sense to you, or if you have other ideas for how to help the industry embrace openness, and reusability, or if you just have a passion for seeing manufacturing get smarter and more efficient, we'd love it if you'd engage with us at SESME, with our counterparts of the Industry 4.0 team in Europe, or with other groups that are pushing the industry forward. SESME membership is made up of manufacturers, software developers, researchers, system integrators, and academics, and we're leveraging our resources and funds to accelerate their efforts. We want to push forward the best ideas in the industry and bring, bring together different perspectives and technologies for better, better interoperability. You can learn more about SESME on our website and about some of the technology we're building and advocating for on our GitHub page. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, great overview. It was the first time that we have listened to what this OPCUA for Cloud Library group is doing in detail. To my knowledge, the group is nearly to release, to provide a release candidate, uh, but this is what we can also uh, validate in the Q&A part uh, later today. I'm asking again the group to put questions into the Q&A. Uh, we we'll receive some of them. Um, one of the frequently asked questions is, do we get the slides and the recordings? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, attendees will get uh, exactly all that information, but attendees also will get the summary of the written answers uh, here on the Q&A. So uh, this is a benefit of being online and participating in this online event. I explained yesterday already fantastic uh, webinars from Randy Armstrong uh, about security and REST API-like interfaces of OPCA, which you can find in the OPC Foundation webinar library. But now it's a pleasure for me to invite Randy to introduce all of us into the OPCA IIoT Starter Kit. This is something what we planned a couple of years ago already um, but somehow we had always different topics to do. Uh, but now we have it ready and it's a pleasure to go live today. And um, you can even download all that on GitHub. Uh, but Randy will explain you all the details. I'm handing over to Randy. Good day. My name is Randy Armstrong and I'm here to talk to you about developing OPC UA PubSub applications um, based on the IoT Starter Kit, which is an initiative which the uh, OPC Foundation has uh, been working on. And it provides a number of samples and tutorials to allow coders to develop prototypes 
and explore the capabilities of OPC UA pub sub over MQTT. We are focusing on MQTT because there's been a lot of interest in the marketplace. Uh, there's a lot of people looking at MQTT. They see it as, as something that has potential to solve some of the problems they're trying to solve. And we wanted to sort of uh, dispel the uh, huge amount of misinformation that's been spread about OPC UA. Specifically, OPC UA PubSub and MQTT have been part of the OPC UA specification for a number of years now. Uh, vendors are starting to release their products that support it. And this will continue to happen over the next um, uh, couple of years. So the statements that have been made that somehow you have to make a choice between using MQTT and OPC UA are simply put false. The capabilities that you, if you want to use MQTT, there are mechanisms within the specification to allow you to use it. And what I'll be demonstrating today and talking about today is how you can take advantage of these features. Now, it is worth having some higher level discussions about what UA Pub Sub is and how it relates to UA Client Server. Now, Client server is the workhorse of, of computing applications. It's virtually a huge, almost every application out there is doing some sort of client server operation. Um, and with a client server op situation, is you the client knows about the server, the server has the server has a dedicated channel back to every client. The client sends a request, it gets a response. It's a tightly coupled relationship, and this uh, uh, has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. In a pub sub model, what you have is you have a bunch of publishers um, that are sending out messages to a some sort of middleware, of which MQTT is one example. Describers are listing on that middleware, on an address on the middleware, and they're getting messages from the middleware without really knowing where the subscribers are, or where the publishers are. So you have a situation where your, your publishers and subscribers are completely decoupled. They don't even need to be online at the same time, uh, depending on how your, if, if your middleware supports some sort of message persistence. So this is a useful message paradigm if you have a situation where you need to be sending the same data to a large number of recipients, or if you need to be sending uh, data to recipients that aren't necessarily online or don't care about, you basically it's a send and forget operation. You don't have to, ha you don't want to have two-way two-way uh, communication, or you don't need to have two-way orchestration. And this does not mean that the need for client server goes away. Client server itself solves some other problems very well. Anytime you have a client doing an operation where their, their ability to proceed with the next step depends on the response from the server, then you are going to have to, you want to have the tight coupling because that's the only way you're going to get the latencies that you need to make that application usable. So with OPC UA, our vision is not to say that you have to use, you, you have to sort of buy into using PubSub or buy into using client server. No, we're providing a cohesive framework where you have a number of tools that you could deploy to solve different problems within your factory environment based on which tools are the best tool for the job. So when you're doing your configuration and you're set up, well, you're going to be using UA client server. If you've got a situation where you want to be, you want to do, you, you could want to set up your runtime environment and you think it's helpful to be, use a broker for uh, communication at that point in time, you can, you can use, you could then configure your publishers and, and uh, subscribers using uh, client server and then your runtime environment will be entirely based on, on PubSub. So it is enhances 
the capabilities of OPC UA. So there's a certain amount of value of using MQTT with OPC UA. And one of the most important things is it's an abstraction layer that does not depend on the protocol. Is It's an architecture that works over any kind of middleware. And in fact, it's designed to work with UDP mod multicast and the entire UFA FX effort that's going on down with the controller to controller communication, which the OPC Foundation is working on right now, is all based on UA pub sub using the same configuration mechanisms, the same kind of encodings. All of the all of the infrastructure that's being built to support that is also available to support uh, application developers building with MQTT. And this uh, framework also includes support for binary encoding, it's support for JSON encodings, and potentially other encodings down the road. End-to-end -end security, there's mechanisms in place to, to allow you to send a message and not worry about whether or not you trust the middleware. The standard configuration uh, information model, I'll be talking more about that later in this talk, that's a very important feature. And integration with OPC UA information model. Now, the idea that PubSub works with any middleware is a future-proofing capability that allows you to evolve over time. So I've been around long enough that I know when people were talking about how XML web services were the future of computing, uh, distributed computing, and you had to be crazy if you if you didn't build stuff using XML web services. Well, guess what? XML web services lasted maybe five, maybe 10 years. Now nobody talks about them. Nobody's really even talking about XML as a wire protocol anymore. Because technology evolves, requirements change. People, the technology that was awesome today turns out to be lacking in the future. OPC UA gives you an architecture that can evolve as needs change. The other important part has to do with the information models. Now, it's no longer acceptable just to send out your raw data to the to whoever's receiving it and, and expect them to try and figure out what to do with it. There's a need to describe this data with the context so you can properly understand what this data is and properly operate on it. So it's important to provide information, mo information, information models or develop information models that describe this information in standard ways. And OPC UA has numerous information models. It's got the built-in ones. It's also got a number of other standards bodies developing information models for different verticals from robots to PLCs to kitchen equip to equipment to pumps to pharmaceutical industry, there's there's numerous uh, information models that are available. And you get all of these things if you're using the OPC UA infrastructure. And this is important because when you're trying to get your data into the cloud, the cloud-based applications, they want to operate on well-known information models too because it it allows them to incorporate data from multiple sources much more efficiently. They don't want to have to have data coming in in some custom format from one factory in a different format in another that has to be mapped onto what it, mapped onto a standard representation. They want to see that data coming through in the in the standard representation that it, that it, that it exi that it had in the original device. OPC UA over MQTT does that for you. Now, the starter kit itself is uh, intended for people who love to tinker. Uh, it's been tested on a Raspberry 4, uh, Raspberry Pi 4 with GPIO ports. If you don't have GPIO ports, it runs fine on a VM. It will we'll flip over to a simulation mode. Um, it includes a publisher and a subscriber. Uh, and uh, I'll be demonstrating these here. Everything in this particular version, everything's been developed in .NET, but um, 
plan is we'll we'll try to expand that to uh, other computing languages as well as as, uh, as time goes on. The code is all available on GitHub, and uh, any comments or feedback or questions you have about the presentation today, uh, please feel free to leave uh, start a conversation on the uh, comment section on the GitHub site. So. With PubSub, you've got to start with a publisher. So we have a publisher that um, starts a UA server that has a, a pluggable uh, GPIO mechanism that could map GPI po port, GPIO ports onto an information model. And uh, you can browse this server using any standard UA client. The publisher, uh, the publisher itself is a UA client that collects the data from the server bundles up the messages and sends them out to the broker. Now, because of the nature of PubSub, all of all publishers need to be pre-configured. So to sort of uh, simulate this situation, the configuration of the publishers are in the, are in the data set and the connection JSON files. These two files have, the contents of these two files are completely defined by the OPC UA specification. It's all part of part 14. And um, and there's a binary and a JSON version of it, which is uh, probably not relevant for our examples. But the JSON version um, is what's being used in the sample. Now, these standard files are a key part of the value proposition for uh, OPC UA or MQTT because the working group realized that just putting together a wire protocol and sending data over the sending data over a broker is, is doesn't really solve the problem because you need to have a standard way to configure all of these different devices that you're putting together that it's easy to it's easy to throw together a sample where you're collecting data from a from a GPIO port and, and constructing a JSON message and fire it off but if you've got a thousand devices and you got to configure every one of them that becomes a huge time-consuming task. OPC UA solves this problem by providing standard configuration files and an information model that could be accessed via UA server. So if this UA server supported the PubSub information model, you would be able to have a client, a UA client, come in and edit the PubSub configuration. And this allows you to have to remotely manage all of the all of your publishers on the network from a single application and that's something you're not going to get without the cohesive uh, OPC UA framework. Now the uh, information model uh, for this particular example we want to keep it simple it is a single GPIO pin connected to an LED that um, um, using as a as a simulator for a conveyor belt gate it has a state and a cycle time the state itself has has true labels and false labels um, then you have eu range and engineering units on the cycle time but this is an example simple example of an information model if we had a more complex system such as such as a robot you would have a more complicated set of variables and they would have interrelationships and, and different sets of properties that that would be that uh, would be potentially uh, useful or important important uh, for any consumer of the data to understand the subscriber itself interacts only with the MQTT broker the topic tree in the MQTT broker the uh, topic tree that the samples use uh, is a uh, is based on the configuration file format. There's, if you go and you dig into the configuration file format, you'll find a hierarchy of named items. Well, that's the hierarchy that ends up being the uh, topic tree. So we have a, um, we have the publisher ID. We have uh, sort of a middle tier that that specifies how you, it controls uh, uh, the details that go into the messages, and then you have a uh, a level that describes the object that's being published. The same object's being published in two different uh, uh, two different topics and I'll and I'll explain why there's why we're doing that in the demos is to 
just to illustrate different features of the OPC UA specification. And underneath the, uh, the, uh, uh, the data sets, which is the gate one and gate two, you have the metadata. And this metadata is key for being able to get the information model that is needed to understand the data. So the first demo I'm going to do is I'm going to do some basic publishing with the uh, Raspberry Pi. So So I'm going to going to start the uh, I'm starting it on the Raspberry Pi. And the server is running. I will open up the standard UA client. It should connect. There we go. And as you see, we're getting uh, the data um, changing every 10 seconds. Because that's what the cycle time is. Now, it's in important to note that uh, with UA pub sub messages, only change data is published. So the uh, so in these demos, the the uh, data is being being uh, sampled every or the um, update rates are coming in as f could be coming in as fast as once per second. But since the cycle time is 10 seconds, we're only getting a message published once every 10 seconds. So this is an important efficiency up uh, efficiency uh, feature. So we also see a bunch of uh, information has been published to the um, to the broker. I'll talk about some of the other ones, but I want to focus on the this particular message here. This is the bare minimum message that gets sent out. One of the features of OPC UA of OPC UA pub sub is you have complete control over the what goes into the messages. So if you have a huge number of devices and you and, and, and you don't need a lot of you don't see the need for a lot of metadata in your messages, you can strip them down to minimize the network overhead and only send that information. And when this is converted into a binary format, it gets really it gets really compact. Probably this would probably be less than less than 10 bytes in, in size. And this is uh, this is an important feature that they're using for the UA, UAFX uh, effort where they expect to be able to develop uh, hardware which hand, which is capable of uh, producing and consuming UA pub sub messages. Now if you have other types of subscriber applications that are more dynamic, they, they, uh, they want to be able to uh, Collect data from many different sources, and and they want to use. They don't necessarily want uh, know in advance what they're getting, and they want to be able to process it based on what's in the messages. There's a bunch of other information that could be included, including everything, including uh, stuff such as a data set class ID that tells you that it allows you to correlate uh, messages that have the same structure, even if they're sent from different devices. Um, uh, you can also have a, se a sequence number. A sequence number, a timestamp, as well as a publisher ID. In this case, it's Raspberry 01. So Subscribers generally are disconnected from the um, uh, from the uh, uh, publishers, but sometimes you have a, uh, a subscriber who wants to know what's out there. So we can take advantage of wildcard uh, wildcarding capabilities within uh, MQTT and create a subscriber that can detect whenever a new um, device is on the network. And that's going to be the first demo we'll do here.
Here we go. We're starting the dis discovery agent. Starting the server. And you see this uh, message appears. And so this message itself, uh, it is a vendor, it's called a vendor nameplate. The information model is defined by the OPC UA devices specification, which in there, you go in there, you'll have complete definitions for each one of these things, what it is, what's expected to be there. Uh, in particular, the product instance URI is intended to be a globally unique identifier for the device. In this case, I'm just passing in an identifier I provided to the uh, to the uh, publisher when it started up. But this uh, this could be a the, the maker of the device, their uh, domain name. It could be any other piece of information that's necessary to keep it globally unique. Now, this is this is an actually a very important piece of information if you're pushing data up into the cloud, where they need to know they need to have some unique identifier to separate data coming from all these different sources. They want to be able to correlate this data and say, okay, this particular data is coming from this and this is the identifier for it. And so OPC UA has a standard for creating these identifiers and publishing them along with associated other metadata. For the next demo, we want to actually take a look at the data that, you, that you're getting. Now, in this example, the uh, subscriber has, knows the uh, data set that it's getting in advance because it's been, it's been copied onto the device. So it uses this data, data set to... Uh, interpret the information that it's getting back. However, this is not required. These are all JSON messages. So you could have a generic, uh, a generic um, uh, JSON, or you can have a generic uh, client that processes JSON and can still do useful information with it. But what we're getting here is because we've got the data set, it knows that this particular cycle count is a UN32, which separates it from all the other possible numeric values that um, could that could uh, could show up could be mapped onto a number field in a JSON document. Now the last demo is subscribing to metadata, and this is the key part where we're tying all of this stuff back into the information models that OPC UA provides. So as I mentioned a number of times before, there's a special topic for metadata. So I now started a client that subscribes to that topic and we're getting the same information in the metadata, including some descriptive information that's come from the metadata. So let's go back to the raw message and take a look at So um let's see he've got the fields that show up but most importantly you've got these properties and these properties come from the information model. If you remember before, there was a true state and a false state. Uh, well, the true state and the false state are the, are the properties on the, on the object. And in this case, they happen to have the value open and close. So the metadata allows you to bundle a whole bunch of additional information with every data point that you're bundled, uh, that you're, um, that you're providing. And this information is has names which are defined by standard OPC UA information models. So you don't need to deal with the problem that yeah sure you got you, you had you've got a, a message a message from uh, one device that's, that uh, had a discrete value that that used one label for its true and false state and another device used a different label for its true and false state and then somehow your subscribers have to make sense of these different things. UA standardizes all that and a lot more. 
and uh, you cannot underestimate the value of of simply doing something as simple as picking a name and getting everybody to use it. And of course, um, when you get to start to get into more complicated information models dealing with dealing with uh, uh, complex equipment such as robots or or kitchen equipment, there would be a bunch of potentially additional properties which would be interested to those types of applications that deal with that kind of equipment. So that is the concludes the short demo of the uh, starter kit. I hope you found the discussion useful today and gave you some ideas in terms of how you can take advantage of OPC UA Pub Sub. As I mentioned before, the uh, the code is all available on the OPC Foundation GitHub, along with all the documentation, including uh, complete details on how to set everything up and get started. And any questions, of course, please simply post on that forum. Thank you very much for your time and have a good day. Thank you so much, Randy, for the excellent demonstration. Definitely to position this clearly, OPCUA is not fighting or competing with MQDT. No, we are using it. We are loving it. But again, OPCA is much more. It's a framework to move standardized information over different channels because you need for different scenarios, different mechanisms. This was a clearly message. The IoT starter kit is definitely not for um, real world industrial robust uh, use inside factories. It's for education purpose. This is why we are using a Raspberry Pi play around addressing a specific um, group. Thank you so much, Randy. The next presenter is Alexander Almendinger, and he will give us an update on the use of the CTT tool. Uh, and uh, last year, I know we had a huge investment, increasing test scripts, um, and, and not only for OPCUA, but also including more and more information models to get validated. Um, so this is one of the big topics. Um, but I like to also take the opportunity to say a special thanks to Alexander because he's always helpful in all other areas, not only CDT. So Alex, uh, let's go. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction words. So as Stefan already said, my name is Alexander Almendinger. I'm the head of the European Certification Task Lab, and that is why I'm today giving you a short update about the certification program, or more especially about the compliance test tool, the so-called CTT, but also a very lovely topic of mine, which is the OPC product catalog, which in the future is going to be called OPC Marketplace. So I know I'm the last speaker for this session and you probably want to get something to eat. So I'm not going to waste your time, but let's get started. So as said, the certification update today will be about the compliance test tool. And with the latest release of the compliance test tool, we introduced two major new features. One of them is the import of companion specification test scripts. And the idea here is to pull out the test cases of all those different companion specifications that you're not ending up with a very long list of um, test cases that you're probably not interested in. So instead, we are provi providing import files that you can use to um, extend the tests inside the compliance test tool to match what you integrated into your product. The way this is working is with a simple import wizard, which you'll find in the project menu on the import companion specification tests. And that will provide you the option to either import the conformance units, conformance groups, and all test scripts, or import the profiles, or simply both of them, which would be the normal case. After you've done that, what you will find is that the conformance units list will now show all the different conformance units that are included in that file as well as in the profiles tab, you have all the different profiles and facets that are defined. 
With that, it is now very simple to select what you introduced into your product and what is working fine and which uh, features you want to test. So those companion specification test scripts are actually nothing new. The MDIS group, for example, uh, which is a companion specification from the oil and gas industry, already got their test scripts implemented like three years ago. So they were very fast in getting automated testing going because it is very important in the industry. Another group, the PLC Open group, also already have the test scripts integrated in the CTT and being shipped with every installation. The PA DIM is a set of test scripts which just recently has been added because we wanted to have an easy way of testing PA DIM enabled products for being integrated into a dashboard for a live demonstration at a trade show. So those are the ones that are already available either on request or natively shipped with the CTT, but there are also a lot more that are already under development. So for example, machine tools, they had the same approach a few years ago where they wanted to make sure that the integration of the machines into a dashboard for a demonstrator at a trade show is simple and easy. So that is how their test group started. Today, they already have defined set of test cases as well as developed test scripts ready so um, there's just like in the final phase to get everything prepared and then all the vendors can verify the machine tool implementation um, with the compliance test group. Another group also already started um, with the process is IOLink and for them they actually not just testing information model pieces but also the whole mapping to IOLink and the behavior of, for example an IOLink master. Last but not least also already under development is a group called DEXB. And DEXB is once again something from the process um, industry. So you see that uh, with three of those groups being from the process industry, the process industry is currently a hot topic for OPC UA, where there's a lot of push, and that is why we are also focusing on that. But enough of the companion specification task scripts, let's go to the other topic. So the other major feature we introduced is alarm and condition testing, so ANC. On the left hand side, you see that we already cover a whole bunch of conformance units which are already released with the CTT version that you can already test your product with. And we are already working on the next set. The reason why this has become a higher priority is because there, it is being integrated in a lot of products right now, also in devices, and we want to make sure that you have everything you need to verify this implementation. But you need to know that the way that we are testing alarms is slightly different than other tests. So those test cases and scripts are designed for real world products. So we don't expect to write values to trigger alarms because for a temperature sensor, it is unlikely that we can actually write to the temperature value, right? So the beauty of that is because we're just listening for alarms, there's no configuration needed, at least not for the conformance unit that are currently shipped. There will be some minor configurations needed for the following set of conformance units. And the way this works right now is that we basically listen for an alarm. And once we've received it, we will check the alarm details. Are all fields present that we are looking for? Is everything provided that we need? But then as a next step, are walking through the state machine and making sure that everything that we should be able to do with this alarm, like acknowledging, like providing a comment, like confirming it, is possible to do with the server. So this is everything that we have as news for the compliance test tool, which gets me to my next topic, the product catalog. Now, the way that the product catalog is used today is that we have two different lists. One where you will find all the products that are in the catalog and one different list where you will only find certified products. A product definition right now has just some minor set of information like a title, URL, product image, some descriptions, but also the OPC certificate information. So everything that is about compliance and that is exactly the reason why I'm talking about this today, because it is very much related to certification um, and as important for us as for the end users. 
And all of that was very valid when the product catalog has been designed, but now we just receive some more demands from the end users on this behalf. And that is basically our motivation to update it. So end users are seeking for a way to find OPC UA enabled products where they really can gather uh, product details, which are just about OPC UA. So they're not looking for um, cycle times and PLCs, for example, but they want to search for a specific PL, um, OPC UA feature, which is supported in a PLC, but also quality information about that OPC UA integration. And in order to make all of that easy, of course, there should be a common way to display this kind of information because otherwise it will just be difficult to compare and look at all these details. But also the vendors are seeking for something like that. They are seeking for a way to um, provide the OPC UA related product information as well as highlighting new features. And that is where the new product catalog is basically stepping in. And I am very happy that I can already show you a short tease about that upcoming marketplace. So what you see here is that we are enhancing everything to make it smoother for the user of the marketplace to find the products they're looking for. So you will have additional set of information. We introduced, for example, categories and subcategories to get an easy overview over the products but also filters for all of that. So you can filter for um, a PLC, you can filter for an Ultra ID device or a SDK or whatever. You can even filter for certain markets. And those are just uh, easy, understandable filters. Of course, we are also having uh, more technical filters, which I'm going to talk about later on. But for now, let's focus on what we see here. So what you see is you have a list of products of our board members that are part of the product catalog with some additional information. And that is exactly um, the way that we, you're going to look at it later on. So you will find quality information like whether a product has attended an IOP and has been tested there for being interoperable with other devices and how many times this has been done. So for example, just once, like at least four or five times, or never. Same is for the certification information. So what you see here is how often the product has been certified, whether there is currently a valid certification, whether the certification has expired, or whether it has never gone through certification. And all of that is intended to provide you a good overview over the product and exactly provide that set of information that the end users um, are looking for. Now to extend that and make it easy for the user of the marketplace is that you can, in this exact table, can basically expand the view and get more information. Information like the latest certification information, but also the exact profiles which are supported by that product. You'll get information like the UA capacities. That means what is the maximum number of monitored items that are supported, um, but also quality information, not just about certification, but like I said, also about interoperability workshops. How many have been attended? When have they been attended? So all of that is intended to provide the user of the marketplace a good overview over the OPC UA um, features that are supported as well as the OPC quality. Now we actually even thinking about extending all of that with listing possible communication partners. And the way that this is intended to work is that we will do a, a match of the other side of the communication. So that means if you're currently looking at an OPC UA server, which supports not just data access, but also alarms, then what you will find down there is a OPC UA client, which exactly provides the same set of features. So where you not can only look for um, the data values, the process data, but you can also see the alarms coming in that being issued from the server so that you have the highest uh, percentage of coverage of the features. Like I already pointed out, the marketplace will come 
with a lot of filter mechanisms because that is exactly what everybody is looking for. So what I did here is I um, established filters for an OPC UA server. I wanted to, it to support an address space lookup, but also historical access. And that now shrinks it down to one entry, which is um, the C++ SDK of unified automation, which exactly provides me this kind of information. And um, yeah, provides me all the different products here. So like I said, the whole product list is intended to provide you a easy list that you can now go through and evaluate every product to make sure that all the other product aspects are also meeting your criteria. As I already pointed out, those are not the only set of filters. So those were just the easy to understand filters, which provides you a good overview. But we also understand that there are people having the necessity to look for an exact profile and facet match. So for doing that, we will also provide the capability for filtering with more technical filters. That basically means that you can now add to your current filter set a very specific facet, for example, the auditing server facet. And with this, you will now, in addition to all the other filters that you already have selected, will um, get even a shorter list. So with this, we make sure that people like purchasing departments or people that want to look on possible products from the market that they could use in the system, that they can go with the exact requirement into that marketplace and find what they're looking for. And another thing that you see here is, of course, also a different display in case that you're not interested in a table view or a list view uh, where you can select your own columns. You're probably just interested in getting a nice overview over the uh, products in the marketplace. And this is exactly what we provide here. So I hope that you are as excited about that new product uh, catalog or in the future called Marketplace than I am and that you are looking forward to um, get this all of this established. So if you have any questions about that or the compliance test tool or you have some feedback for us, please do not hesitate. Send, that, uh, send your feedback to me and I'm very happy to hear from you after the session. Thank you so much, Alexander, for that presentation. And I noticed that there are already coming in a couple of questions about availability and uh, when products can be listed and how to get products inside. But that's exactly a good area for all the Q&A sessions, which is starting now in a second. First of all, I would love to thank all the speakers for this excellent content this morning. Um, thank you very much also, obviously, for the attendees to join. Um, so don't forget to dial in tomorrow morning in time.